On the 24th of June last year, Britain woke up to a political earthquake. The sun has risen on an independent, united kingdom. The shockwaves spread across Europe. It's incredible, it's unbelievable, it's impossible. This was the first reaction, shock. In Britain, we're now consumed by what Brexit means for us. But for the European Union, Brexit is one crisis of many. <laughs> Following our historic vote, I set off across Europe to meet the populist Eurosceptics taking this continent by storm. no. no. Ils se sont trompés sur tout depuis 30 ans. And I've been witnessing the continuing misery with the euro in the countries of the south. The Italians have very good cause to be very, very angry. Italy is not Greece. If the euro collapses, that is the beginning of the end of the EU. Add the migrant crisis and it's a perfect storm. Even those at the helm wonder if the EU can survive. The risk that we fall apart is a real risk, yes. For the first time in the history of European integration, we can fail. Failure is possible. This is new European politics, Italian style. In a nation obsessed with beauty, Alessandro Di Battista is possibly Italy's most glamorous politician. He's a leader of a movement called Five Star. Everyone wants to touch him, everyone wants to kiss him. This is a bit of a rock star of the Five Star movement. He's just been on a coast-to-coast -coast tour of Italy, meeting people, live blogging as he goes, posing for Instagram. The Five Star Movement really is the party to watch in Italy right now. It's only a few years old, but it's threatening to bring down the Italian political establishment with its anti-establishment, anti-capitalist, anti-EU, populist, nationalist message that's taking Italy by storm. Alessandro Di Battista. Buonasera a tutti e grazie. Grazie. If Di Battista is the rock star of Five Star, the godfather of the movement is a very different kind of politician. There he is. <laughs> Pepe Grillo is known for being um, uh, a little bit creative, a little bit idiosyncratic. Um, will he do the interview? Will he not do the interview? You never know. Part of the excitement. Signor Grillo, sono Katia Arla della BBC. Piacere, piacere. <laughs> un abbassamento di voce perché la passione mi consuma dall'interno perché io faccio, sono un comediante lo capisci che il mio, il mio cervello non ragiona dal leader di un movimento politico io penso una cosa poi il giorno dopo ne dico un'altra il populismo è una bellissima parola populista sono orgoglioso di essere un populista dobbiamo dire di no il no 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 ma c'è una parte della società come il mondo No, che non ha niente. Si può cambiare? Si è già cambiato, è già, cam è già cambiato. Loro hanno paura di questo, della gioia, hanno paura delle, del, del senso dell'umore, dell hanno paura dell'ironia. E vincerete il prossimo Assolutamente sì.
Mi baci adesso, mi, so, vuole, mi baci, vedo che proprio non ce la fa, mi baci, kiss me. Sì, volevo. Oh, baby. Dreamy, have a home, I'll say. I gotta save you, baby. Grillo started out as a blogger and stand-up comic. He's now a cult figure and one of the most influential politicians in his country. Polls show his party is Italy's most popular. Five Star is a rather haphazard movement, but one thing is clear. They want to vote on whether Italy should leave the Euro, a serious threat to the power brokers in Brussels. This movement of Mr. Grillo has for everything a scapegoat, for nothing a solution. Grillo is loud, uh, funny from time to time, ugly from time to time with the words, nasty with his words. But I'm looking for a single solution for what to do. He proposed nothing. I think it's a wave of feelings against the establishment, against, in some cases, the rules, against whatever can threaten what I know. I do not have one single uh, example in mind of an anti-establishment policy that has managed to solve one single problem. <laughs> Che dice ai critici del 5 Stelle che dicono, perché anche lei parla di come è facile criticare in governo, la vita è molto più complicata, è difficile la realtà di essere. Ma io non ho mai pensato che governare fosse facile. Gli altri hanno governato e hanno fallito, noi vogliamo la nostra occasione, per cui quello che dico è che vogliamo essere messi alla prova. Five Star is part of a phenomenon taking Europe by storm. In over 20 years of living and working across Europe, I've never seen anything like it. In almost every EU country, there's now an anti-establishment, nationalist-minded movement on the rise. Dutch right-wing leader Geert Wilders is typically Eurosceptic. We don't want Brussels, we don't want the European Union. This is the flag where we are proud of. Euroscepticism has spread as part of growing anger at traditional elites. And Brexit broke a taboo. Everyone knows now, if you don't like the EU, you can leave. Je pense que c'est euh, l'année du patriotisme, c'est l'année du grand retour des nations et des peuples. J'en suis absolument convaincu. Et la fin de l'Union européenne aussi, vous croyez Mais écoutez, encore une fois, soit elle change radicalement, profondément, et elle abandonne son caractère autoritaire, soit elle mourra. People have lost trust in politicians, and they are saying, let's try something different. In most cases, that is causing problems for mainstream political parties and domestic politics, but it isn't threatening the existence of the state. The difference for the EU is it, it, it's a fundamental challenge to its existence. They're shouting from the sidelines and they're affecting discourse amongst the mainstream political parties, and we have a populist party doing fairly well in almost every European country except for Cyprus. Et tu, et tu. E tu, tu sei arrivato, ma hai guardato e allora tutto è cambiato. I live in Brussels, the heart of the EU, but Italy has always played a big part in my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm going to drive a Cinquecento, I'm going to drive it. Like an Italian. Here in the south, it feels a million miles from the calm, organized streets of Brussels. <laughs> this is so Italian. The cars are allowed in here. <laughs> 
Sicily has always been amongst the poorest and most chaotic parts of Europe. One of the reasons for the EU was to make places like this richer and more mainstream, but downtown Palermo feels more left behind than ever. Old toys, bashed up toys, I mean, more and more and more, it's like a sea. No surprise then that it's a five-star stronghold. I've come to an industrial area to catch up with someone I met at the five-star rally. Ciao! Salgo fuori! Questo era un parcheggio dove posteggiavano gli operai che andavano a lavorare in fabbrica. Sì. Sì. Da piccolo. Erano giorni di, di speranza, vero? Certo. Sebastiano used to work in a factory complex dominated by a Fiat plant. In 2011, Fiat closed its gates and moved production to Eastern Europe, where labor is cheaper, triggering a wave of factory closures here. This was the factory where I worked, you can see. I've been here since 2012, I don't work. And how do you feel to see all these factories closed? It was a sad thing. Il futuro è negato, non lo so. Thousands of workers here, like Sebastiano, see themselves as victims of globalization and the European Union. It's a story repeated across southern Europe. In parts of Greece, Spain and Italy, half of all young people are out of work. Italy was one of the EU's founding members. Faced with corruption and weak governments at home, Italians have traditionally been EU enthusiasts. But not anymore. It's September, and the current Italian government is facing a huge challenge. The Prime Minister here, Matteo Renzi, came to government promising to change Italy or change jobs. He is now holding a referendum on political reform, but if he loses, Five Star, of course, are waiting in the wings. Matteo Renzi is a centre-left politician and a passionate European. He thinks of himself as a radical reformer. He's called the referendum on a series of constitutional changes designed to unblock Italy's costly, corrupt and sluggish political system. Hello. Sorry for Hi, Prime Minister, thank you. I'm good, and you? Very good, thanks. I'm sorry for the evening. You've called a referendum for the 4th of December. Calling referendums, as we know, is a huge political gamble. Doesn't that worry you? I know in 2016, I used the expression referendum in EU, it's a risk. But jokes apart, I believe this is a great challenge for Italian people, as I'm not worried. We went back a few months and David Cameron wasn't worried. Thank you so much for this, uh, <laughs> for this uh, benchmark. I hope, I hope the result will be different. Isn't there a risk, though, that you know, we've seen in so many European countries, we look over the Atlantic to the United States, there are more and more angry people, people who feel they've been left behind and who are angry at the establishment. And even though you want to change Italy, the risk is Italians may just vote against you as part of what they see as an elite. This is a risk, it's a clear risk, but I think the message of populist will be defeated in the next election. So I'm not worried for the growth of Five Star Movement. Five Star is campaigning for a no vote in the referendum against Matteo Renzi and the Italian establishment as a whole. A no vote might mean early elections here, which Five Star could win. After Brexit, Another potential body blow for the European Union. It's October, and there's another European referendum in the air. This time, on migration. I've made my way to southern Hungary, the very edge of the EU. Not long ago, the epicenter of a major European crisis. More than a million refugees and other migrants came flooding into Europe in 2015. In Hungary, the authorities were not exactly welcoming. 
több százával több ezri naponta, meg a zöldségeket kitaposták. Szóval nem néztek semmit. Farmers living on Hungary's border, like Lajos Marki, found themselves on the front line. A lakosság attól is, hogy valami probléma lesz, meg, meg eleve egy, ahogy mondom, olyan betegségeket beoldanak onnan, ami itt nálunk már nem ismeretős. The EU seemed unable to take charge. Extreme right-wing mayor Laszlo Taroksai became an internet sensation after he launched anti-migrant patrols and posted his action movies on YouTube. Ha ülve maradunk, áldozatokká válunk. Ha felállunk és cselekszünk, akkor győzhetünk. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Mayor Taroksai says he's defending Christian Hungary against a Muslim invasion. Lakóinak, ha nem állítjuk meg ezt a folyamatot, akkor akár több tízmillió migráns is eláraszthatja Európát, és ez véres konfliktusokhoz vezethet Európában, megváltoztatja Európa kulturális, vallás összetételét, nemzetiség összetételét. Rához én ezt nem szeretném. Én magyarnak születtem, és azt szeretném, hogy Magyarország maradjon magyar, és a magyar kultúra és a keresztény kultúra alapjain álljon a jövőben is. Despite his extreme views, the mayor is influential here. And in autumn 2015, he got what he'd been demanding. In complete defiance of EU rules, Hungary unilaterally closed off its border with a 140-mile razor-wire fence patrolled 24-7 by thousands of guards, as well as the mayor's personal team. Shouldn't Hungary have waited for a European Union solution before acting unilaterally? Hát én azt látom, hogy Brüsszel képtelen megoldást találni erre a problémára. Magyarországnak muszáj volt, és ásotthalom településnek muszáj volt valamilyen megoldást találni. But it wasn't just Hungary. Other EU countries soon followed suit. In the blink of an eye, the EU dream of open border Europe was shattered. I've come to Hungary's capital, Budapest. In the wake of the migrant crisis, the EU has called on all its member states to give asylum to some of the refugees. Out of a million, Hungary has been asked to take just 1,300. The government here has called a referendum on the issue. And it's pretty obvious how they want people to vote. And then you see a government poster talking about safeguarding the future of Hungary. It has spent a fortune on this poster campaign, plastering them all over the country, very anti-EU, very, very anti-migrant basically nationalist and emphasizing the importance of Hungary and national sovereignty. Because here in Hungary, the Eurosceptic nationalists are already in power. Prime Minister Viktor Orbán has made a career out of Brussels bashing. Nem fogadjuk el, hogy bármilyen kifinomult módszerrel idegenek kormányozzalak. Viktor Orbán isn't the only thorn on the EU inside. Hungary has teamed up with Poland, Slovakia and the Czech Republic to form a controversial new voting bloc, nicknamed the Visegrad Group. Viktor Orbán, man of the people, doesn't actually like speaking to the people very much, at least not people who might disagree with him. So, we at the BBC, we've tried for years to get an audience, but we failed. Instead, today, we're going to be speaking to his right-hand man, the Foreign Minister of Hungary. Slovakia, Czech Republic and Poland, those are your partners in the Visegrad group. Yeah, right. Are you kind of like a gang at the side? Do you sit together? Do people sort of, you know, is, is that how it works? Yeah, usually uh, we sit, to sit together uh, before the meetings. We usually text each other. So you send each other texts during meetings? Yeah, that, that, that happens sometimes as well, yeah. Do you see yourselves a bit like um, the bad boys of the EU at the moment? I wouldn't say this. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know... Do you think, I, Bru I, I, do you think Brussels would say No, it? no, I, I don't like these kind of classifications. What I can understand is that it's not pretty much welcome. 
and uh, it's not without a good reason that whenever the prime ministers of the Visegrad countries meet, uh, usually uh, before that the uh, other prime ministers of Western Europe is really angry. What's going to happen? And this is now the You're tightest. You're happy about that. You're smiling. No, I, I would say I would say it's a it's a kind of you know it's a signal of respect because if we were not important, then nobody would care. There have been so many decisions made about Central Europe without asking Central Europeans. Now it's not possible anymore. It's impossible. Finally, there's a voice of Central Europe. To truly understand Hungary's relationship with Europe, I'm taking a ride on the underground. Budapest's Line 1 is the oldest in continental Europe, built when Hungary was the co pires Have a look at the architecture here and take a wild guess. Line 2 and 3 were built with Soviet help when Hungary was a communist state. It really is out of Soviet central casting. So Line four, new and shiny, co-funded by the EU. Economically, Hungary depends on the European Union, but politically, this country couldn't be further away from the EU vision of ever closer union. Europe unites two totally distinct cultures. There's the Western European culture, born from the post-war shock of what had happened and the feeling that it was nationalism that destroyed Europe. And there's the Eastern European culture. They were occupied by the Soviets. Nationalism was outlawed. They feel that having shaken off the shackles of the Soviet Empire, they don't want to be oppressed by the European Empire. Viktor Orban seems to relish goading the EU. I've come to the small village where he was born. It's undergone something of a boom since he became prime minister, with a new football stadium and one of Europe's more unusual railways, one of Victor's pet projects. Most az elárulom önnek, hogy ez a vasútvonal, ez amellett a ház mellett ment el, hogy a gyerekkoromban töltöttem. Csak az én szívemhez ez közel és egész gyerekkoromban azon ábrán, hogy egyszer majd én is hajtányolhatok. So I'm on a train that basically goes from one end to the other end of Viktor Orban's village. So it starts nowhere particularly interesting, goes nowhere particularly interesting, and really, it just defies any logic. It's basically one big ego trip. An EU-funded ego trip. 80% of the funding for this three-and-a-half-mile train line and its three stations has come from the EU, a cool two million euros. Viktor Orban is dogged by allegations of cronyism and corruption. But autocratic Mr Orban doesn't take kindly to criticism. In fact, he's pretty much banned it by taking over large chunks of the media. He's a great admirer of Vladimir Putin and an increasing embarrassment for the European Union. Take this little interaction with European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker. Jean-Claude Juncker famously said, hello, dictator. The media laughed, but there's a serious aspect to that. The EU have been critical of laws inside countries that don't respect human rights or the rule of law or freedom of speech. There you have Hungary on your doorstep. How do you deal with that inside your family? The consistency of our uh, laws, of our systems, of our reality inside the European Union has to be 100% solid. Otherwise, first, we lose our soul. And second, uh, we lose our credibility. The European Commission is the guardian of European laws, and yet all, all there are are rebukes and studies, no, but no are, action. No, there are, there are instruments that can be used. But, but they're not used. There are, no, they, they, are. Can, they can be used. They can be used. But they haven't been used. We have human rights issues, not only in one country, but in many. 
The EU seems powerless to act when a country is not abiding by those fundamental principles that are in our EU treaties. Uh, they talk about it, but they don't know what to do about it. Viktor Orban's latest two fingers to Brussels is the referendum on migration. Saying no to immigration and challenging Brussels goes down well at home. Like the Brexit vote, this referendum highlights the gulf between ordinary voters and the EU. So this is the moment that everyone's been waiting for. Victor Orban on the stage announcing the referendum result. And even though there was a low voter turnout, surprise, surprise, he says it was a huge success. Brüsszel vagy Budapest, ez volt a kérdés, és mi úgy döntöttünk, hogy a döntés joga kizárólag Budapestet illeti meg. Köszönöm a részvételt, a szavazatokat és a támogatást. Számítok önökre a jövőben is, és önök is számíthatnak rám. Hajrá Magyarország, hajrá Magyarok! And that's it. He's off. No questions allowed. We sent a clear message to Brussels that we want to control our own border, we want to have our sovereignty entirely, and we want to make the decision whom we let come in our country and whom we do not. What happens if Brussels does just ignore it? What will you do? What will Hungary they say? They can't do it. It would be too much. They cannot do it. I mean, if you speak about democratic European Union, if you speak about bring Europe closer to people, you must not deny will of 3.2 million people in one country. It's a very hypocritic behavior, I, guess. I, f I, I think so. The problem is the member states uh, play the game. There is that union. We have nothing to do with it. That union is playing against us. That blame game is uh, a virus which could lead to the end of the European Union. So you have member states pointing the finger of blame here at Brussels. You're sitting here and saying it's their fault and their responsibility. Throwing mud both sides is one thing, but in the meantime, the European Union is falling apart. But not because of me. I try to keep it together. These are people like Mr. Orban who argue against the European Union. If the heads of state in the European Union do not stop pointing the finger of blame at Brussels, is the EU finished? If that uh, would continue as today, the risk that we fall apart is a real risk, yes. And what is the solution to all this Euro griping? I've got an appointment to meet a man who thinks he has the answer, Guy Verhofstadt, former Belgian Prime Minister and Chief Negotiator for Brexit for the European Parliament. I just have to find him deep in the maze that is the Parliament's headquarters here in Brussels. I'm looking for 55C011. Um, I was told that in a way that I should know where that is. Um, excuse me, please. 5C011? But I'm sure you're looking for 5 and not 5.5. What, what's 5.5? Five five? Who are you looking for? Um, uh, Giefer Hofstadt. This is not the good floor. The, you have to go one floor up to take the lift on that side. But that's floor six, right? No, this is floor five. Yeah. And you, you will have bathroom 5.5. Five, five. five and a half? Yeah. OK, all right, <laughs> floor five and a half. <laughs> yeah. OK, I'll, um, I'll find, thank you very much. No thank problem. you. If you want to get an idea of how Brussels works, try spending a few hours in here. I still can't quite get over it. Five and a half. Floor five, five. Floor five, five. Yes. Giefer Hofstadt believes the only answer to the EU's current woes is to complete European Union and create a true European government. Bingo. Here it is. We have to reform this whole business, a more effective union, a more democratic union with a real European government. 
with a, a real European defense uh, 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 ca capacity. European army? A European army, yeah. What's wrong on this? Here in Europe, yeah, we don't act. We don't take the decision because you need unanimity before you can do something. And that doesn't work in the world of, the, of today. But look at France, look at Italy, I, look at uh, Denmark, Sweden. I mean, the list goes on, as you know. H how much support do you think there is for an idea? Not like more that? and more. Popular support. Yeah, yeah, more and more. What we feel is that um, since the Brexit, something had changed. I told after Brexit, oh, we're going to now have a referendum in the Netherlands about Nexit, a referendum in Denmark about Dexit. It didn't happen. What we see is exactly the opposite. Mr. Hofstad, I have to tell you that you are pretty much the only optimistic voice left. You know, no. and yes, in my work, whether it's the news on Europe or whether it's on this documentary. In your world, yeah. But at the same time, don't underestimate that, how, how could I say, the counter-revolution is already underway. Ordinary citizens who don't want it to destroy Europe, who are asking for a reformed European Union that's more effective. So since the Brexit, something had changed. <laughs> In its essence, the EU has always been a political project, a massive post-war mission to guarantee continental peace and stability. We're in gorgeous northern Tuscany. My mum's best friend is Tuscan and I've been coming here ever since I was born. But many of the problems Europe now faces are caused by the EU's vast economic experiment, the Euro. Love. We were in love. We thought that this was going to be the marriage of the next uh, two centuries. If you look at the statistics on the surveys on who liked most the Euro, Italy was always the leader. The North is the richest part of Italy. It's the industrial heartland of the country, as well as a tourist magnet. I'm paying a visit to Empoli. It's a town I've been coming to since I was little. Look how many for rent signs there are, all these closed down shops. It's actually quite shocking. I mean, this is supposedly posh Northern Tuscany. And I remember lots of very elegant Northern Tuscan shops. Uh, that's what made it so exciting to come here in the summer. In the nearby village of Vinci, I'm meeting up with an old friend. In oh, fact, a childhood Ciao. sweetheart. Ciao. We used to play here as kids. Ah, the monument of Leonardo. This is the where all the kids from little si divertono. Anche il mio, mio fratello, <laughs> se mi ricordo, però con i genitori tedeschi. No, 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 <laughs> non è sicuro. <laughs> Tu ti ricordi come perché siamo stati molto più giovani sì. quando è arrivato l'euro e arrivati con Italia con molta speranza. Sì. Ti ricordi di quei tempi, sì. Sì. la prima volta di andare nel banco ma e certo. prendere tutti i ricordi? E, prendi, e prendevi l'euro sì. e credevamo che forse l'Europa era la soluzione migliore, cioè un qualcuno che ci guardasse dall'alto e ci potesse anche proteggere. Il problema è che quest'euro forse non ha fatto quello che, che tante persone credevano. La Questo vita in Italia è, è diventata più... Più, più, più cara, più eh, cara. sì. L'euro è uno dei motivi che ti dà la crisi economica e tutto noi che dobbiamo uscire dall'euro. Ma è l'euro che deve cambiare mentalità. Like many people around here, Fausto has fallen on hard times. His restaurant business collapsed and he now has three part-time jobs to try and make ends meet. Europe's middle classes have traditionally been big EU enthusiasts, but the Euro crisis hit them hard. Fausto's backing the Eurosceptic Five Star Movement. Without fundamental change, he can't see much future for his children. <laughs> 
per il loro futuro. La nostra speranza forse è che loro vadano fuori dall'Italia, se non trovano niente di buono, guarda a noi. Ecco. Però questo Però... è triste per un... un... È molto no, triste. Devono diventare cittadini del mondo. Una cosa triste perché si rischia di perdere qualcosa che, è che a noi c'è caro. È come perdere la casa. The problems of the euro have dragged on for years since Greece first plunged the continent into crisis. A fundamental flaw of the euro is that it's made southern Europe, including big economies Italy and Spain, uncompetitive. While the north, especially Germany, has boomed. This creates deep and bitter European divisions. The Italians have very good cause to be very, very angry. Italy is not Greece. Italy is a successful country, and yet Italy is sliding deeper every year into a debt deflationary cycle. And that is because of the design of the euro. The signs of economic collapse are everywhere. The euro alone can't be blamed, but at one point in Italy, a thousand companies were going bust every day. Across the eurozone, a dangerous explosion of debt follow the 2008 economic crash. It's December, and one of Italy's most famous national institutions is in free fall. The oldest bank in the world is Tuscan. Monte dei Paschi di Siena is Italy's third biggest bank. Monte dei Paschi di Siena, una storia italiana dal 1472. According to stress tests, this is the weakest bank in Europe. Monte dei Paschi has a mountain of toxic debt. Here are some worrying numbers for you. This bank alone has more than 40 billion pounds worth of bad debt. Look across the Italian banking sector and there you see more than 300 billion pounds worth of toxic debt. And then there's the Italian government. With two trillion pounds worth of debt, that is the highest debt to national income level in the whole of the EU after Greece. How vulnerable does that make this country? Under pressure, the Italian government has agreed to a bailout but the rot at the heart of the Italian economy remains. I think Italy is probably one of the biggest risks for Europe. Um, it is such a large country, it's the third largest economy in the Eurozone. Um, and so if we did have Italy go into crisis, there would likely be contagion elsewhere. <sighs> So this, this is quite something. Um, this is a very mainstream Italian newspaper, and yet it's got one article threatening that Italy is poised to walk out of the Eurozone, and another article saying why that the majority of Italians think that Germany is doing extremely well out of the single currency, whereas it says that more than 90% of Italians think the Euro has been a complete disaster. If a country like Italy, with an economy the size of Italy, were to leave the euro, there are many people here who say that would be the beginning of the end of the euro, and many argue that if the euro collapses, that is the beginning of the end of the EU, because that is the most central and important project uh, really in the EU's 60-year history. That would end in a disaster, economic disaster, and a reintroduction of the German mark in Europe in relation to Italian lira and French franc. It's not necessary to be a Nobel Prize in economy to understand that that would lead to a disaster in Europe. The Eurozone crisis has turned Europeans against Europeans. It has uh, sown division in Europe. And that will stigmatize Europe for a very long time to come. It's a bit like invading Russia. It starts off beautifully. It is a very spirited advance remember Napoleon, Hitler, and so on, until you get bogged down in the snow, and you end up with blood on the snow. And this is what's happening now in the European Union. I'm back in Rome as the Italian referendum approaches, catching up with the rock star politician of the Five Star Movement. <laughs> Fare. 
The referendum is meant to be about constitutional reform, but Five Star has turned it into a vote of no confidence in Prime Minister Renzi's government. Renzi dice che è un uomo del popolo. Renzi si vede come il supereroe che vuole cambiare le leggi italiane per aiutare al popolo italiano. E tutto ciò che, di cui Renzi parla nel Parlamento non arriva. Se fosse così bravo, così amato dal popolo, per quale motivo una forza come il Movimento 5 Stelle da rappresentare un vero nemico politico nei confronti di Matteo Renzi che ha perso del tutto il consenso appunto nel Paese? Anti-Renzi protests slip into violence. So confident just a few months before, it's now clear he's fighting for his political life. Se vince il no, è evidente che il paese è meno forte. Il nostro sì deve, cambiare, deve servire a cambiare l'Europa, deve servire a cambiare il mondo. And true to the 2016 anti-establishment script, Italians vote by a margin of 60 to 40 against the government. It's a bitter personal humiliation for Matteo Renzi. Buonasera a tutti, scusate il leggero ritardo. Oggi il popolo italiano ha parlato, ha parlato in modo inequivocabile. Ho perso e lo dico a voce alta, anche se con il nodo in gola, perché non siamo robot. Non sono riuscito a portarvi alla vittoria. Viva l'Italia, in bocca al lupo a tutti noi. Another pro-European politician booted off stage. Another slap in the face for the EU. Amid typically Italian chaos and uncertainty, there are rumors of an early general election. All great news for Five Star. Five more years of lack of growth. Five more years of rising unemployment among the youth. The more you stay in the recession, the more people grow angrier, the more the political parties are in power will lose consensus, the more populistic parties will grow, and the quicker the construction will fall apart. We don't have much time. But if this uprising in Italy feels like another blow to the European project, it's in France where it might meet its Waterloo. In Abonnement in northern France, another of Europe's desperate outposts, France isn't Greece or Italy. The French economy has always been relatively successful. But the national mood is deeply gloomy, especially in places like this. Jean-Claude Lair was one of more than 800 workers at this metalworks before it closed. Production moved to China. Maintenant, au niveau de l'Europe, on sent qu'on est un peu abandonné. Non, on dépend de Bruxelles. On peut rien faire sans Bruxelles, mais quel est... moi, je suis un peu déçu par, ce... par le rôle des... de l'Europe. Totalement. Fermeture a été vraiment un désastre économique et social. C'est le monde ouvrier qui, qui est tombé sur, ben, sur le cul, excusez-moi l'expression. Et puis, vous savez, quand on ferme une usine, il ben, y a... Il y a une détresse qui s'installe, la misère qui, qui arrive. C'est bien triste. C'est une histoire bien triste pour moi. In 2014, this town elected a mayor from the anti-immigration, anti-globalisation Front National, known for its nostalgic nationalism. Ici, nous sommes dans le Nord Pas-de-Calais, une région qui a toujours été fortement industrielle, et petit à petit, tous ces métiers-là sont en train de disparaître. Alors, ils ne disparaissent pas comme ça euh, par euh, un, un coup de baguette magique. Ils disparaissent parce qu'ils sont la conséquence d'un processus. Globalisation, ça, c'est la guerre. Ça, c'est une vraie guerre. Marine Le Pen, c'est une femme politique et elle connaît les problèmes des Français. 
C'est une femme issue du peuple. Et les Français se reconnaissent en elle. It's January, and I'm in Paris to meet Marine Le Pen, leader of the Front National. The party was founded by her father, Jean-Marie Le Pen, who was widely condemned for his extreme right-wing views. But Marine insists that the old divisions of right and left no longer apply to the current revolution in European politics. Je pense que la fracture gauche-droite est un leurre. Voilà, c'est une fracture artificielle euh, qu'on pérennise depuis des années pour cacher qu'il y a une autre alternative. La vraie fracture, le vrai clivage, il est entre les patriotes et les mondialistes. Voilà. Et moi, je suis du côté du patriotisme et c'est vrai que beaucoup de dirigeants européens euh, étaient jusqu'à présent encore du côté du mondialisme. Ces jours-là, vous voyez le début de la fin de l'Union européenne Si France sort de l'euro, l'euro, c'est fini, hein. c'est fini. Peut-être, et alors L'euro n'est plus une monnaie, l'euro est une arme politique. L'euro est un couteau que l'Union européenne met dans le dos des peuples pour les forcer à aller là où ils ne veulent pas aller. Vous croyez que nous, la France, on va accepter de vivre dans, sous le chantage, sous la menace, mais de qui De gens qui ne sont pas élus Mais il n'en est pas question. Vous êtes en faveur de Frexit Mais écoutez, deux, deux choses l'une. Soit l'Union européenne rend au peuple français la souveraineté territoriale, ses frontières, la maîtrise de son économie, la maîtrise de sa monnaie et la supériorité de ses lois. Soit je dirais aux Français, il faut sortir de l'Union européenne. Car le programme que je veux mettre en œuvre est interdit par l'Union européenne. Faire du patriotisme économique, c'est interdit par l'Union européenne. On l'a vu pendant le Brexit. Qu'est-ce qu'on n'a pas entendu Le soleil allait s'éteindre, euh, des tremblements de terre euh, allaient engl engloutir euh, Londres, euh, les poissons euh, flotteraient euh, et, euh, sur le... le... Mais c'est de, de la folie. Et qu'est-ce qui s'est passé ben, Il s'est passé que des bonnes choses jusqu'à présent, me semble. Et qu'est-ce que vous dites aux gens qui disent « mais vous ne respectez pas euh, les immigrants, euh, les juifs, que le Front National, que c'est que, que un, une partie politique euh, raciste, xénophobe, euh, anti-immigrant ?» Vous savez que, que ces critiques existent. Non mais écoutez, même en France, ces critiques ne sont plus non plus courtes. Alors je veux bien que la Manche nous sépare. Enfin, c'est pas si grand que ça quand même, que l'information n'arrive... Toutes ces, toutes ces insultes n'existe même plus en France. Bon, il faut arrêter de les déverser, euh, encore une fois, en, en Grande-Bretagne. Ça, c'est l'argumentation de ceux qui n'ont rien à dire sur le fond. The Front National's views on migration and Islam make Marine Le Pen one of the most divisive figures in European politics. But she's a top contender in presidential elections here this spring. Accepted wisdom predicts French voters of the left and centre will come together to prevent a Front National president. But polls and political wisdom can't be trusted these days. Victory for Marine Le Pen uh, in the French presidential election would be the end of the European Union. There is a serious risk that France, one of the biggest members of the European Union, a founding member of the European Union, part of that Franco-German access, if France were to leave, that would be probably the death blow. Brexit is hard for the EU to cope with, but we were always, the UK, a semi-detached nation. This would be a fundamental blow, and many people believe it would not recover. That woman who wants to become president of France would win an election. It's, it's unthinkable, I think. Unthinkable, definitely not going to happen, in your opinion, Marine Le Pen. You're relaxed about the French presidential election. She will never win, uh, absolutely sure. Would you bet on that, though? Yes. Quand on a parlé avec Martin Schulz, il a dit « Madame Le Pen, président de la France, impensable ». Oui, il disait aussi « le Brexit, impossible » et « l'élection de Donald Trump, impossible ». Non mais ces gens sont incroyables. Ils se sont trompés sur tout depuis 30 ans. With Britain on the way out, France flirting with Marine Le Pen 
and Italy in political and economic turmoil. The fate of the continent increasingly seems to lie here in Germany and with one politician. Es geht um nicht mehr und nicht weniger als um die Zukunft Europas und damit um die Zukunft Deutschlands in Europa. For 12 years, Angela Merkel has been the real power behind the EU. EU membership has meant so much for her country, the chance for a new European beginning after the horrors of the Nazi past. Though dented by the migrant crisis, with the unfolding drama of Donald Trump's presidency, many see Merkel as the champion of moderation. And her government remains deeply committed to the EU. We are benefiting from Europe. We have seen the history, and in the present, we are benefiting from Europe. We are so well off as never before. This is due to the Euro. This is due to our unity. Europe is the best thing that can happen for our interests. So our main interest, the pivotal interest, is to make Europe work again. One of Angela Merkel's nicknames used to be Queen of Europe, but her crown has now slipped. The migrant crisis has damaged her not only here at home, but also abroad. Now, she used to be known for bullying or charming other EU countries into following one EU line. So she was the glue, if you like, that held things together. Now that glue is becoming unstuck. And for many ordinary Germans, Europe seems to have become a bit of a joke. And a bad one. Die große europäische Freiheit, die den Geborenen auf den Trümmer zweier Weltkriege ist zu einem Bürokratiemonster verkommen. Wir aufnehmen. Germans are tired of having to stump up for endless Greek bailouts. And there are doubts about Germany's ability to integrate up to a million refugees and other migrants. And now Germany has its own populist, Eurosceptic nationalist party the AFD. The themes are familiar, anti-migrant, anti-EU, and especially in the wake of recent terror attacks, anti-Islam. In painfully politically correct Germany, this is hugely significant. I joined uh, in January 2016 because I was so shocked, you know, the, the borders had been opened. I thought this, this loss of serenity, this loss of home made many people rethink their political ideas. We need a, a strong voice of the right wing in, in the parliament. Everything else is progressive, left wing, bad. You know, there was a, a big problem in German policy uh, with political correctness and many people said, I don't feel represented by the parties in Germany. And so uh, the AFD was founded. Now we have much more diverse opinions in the German policy and that's a fresh life for democracy. Polls predict AFD could win 15, even 20 percent of the vote in the general election here this autumn. Germans have a right to decide their own future and it's time that the Germans take back the power from, from, from this bureaucracy in Brussels. For the first time in Germany, European integration is being seriously questioned. It's not possible for Germany to rescue all of the rest of Europe by paying off the debts of Greece and next Italy and then Spain and in the end of France. This is what, it's, it, that's not possible. Look at Greece. You leave Greece on its own, it'll collapse. Greece should leave the euro, yes. The euro and is Italy? too strong. Italy at, at, and as Spain? well and, and, and probably France as well. Portugal? The euro is too strong for them, yes. So this, this is the end of the euro then, isn't it, really, that you're arguing for? If, if, if countries like Germany say, we're not going to help countries with a weaker economy. That, that's it, it's over, isn't it? The euro is not good for the weaker countries, um, and so it's not for the economy. The EU failed to deal as a body with the migrant crisis. It has failed in the Eurozone project. What is it good for, you could be forgiven for asking? We have to do better. Europe remains indispensable. Perhaps it is even more indispensable than ever before in a globalized world. So the only consequence of your description is we have, we really have to do it better.
Do you see yourself as part of a bigger movement in the rest of Europe? Surely, yes. The, the voices are different. I think there's a basic line uh, within all those parties which are now growing in, in, in several states stating that we don't want to give up our sovereignty. And this is why we want to ask the people. The danger of holding a referendum is, even though you're not calling to leave the EU, that's what the German people would vote for if you asked them. Yes, and if people... And the whole thing could crumble. Yes, but you know, if the whole thing crumbles, because the people want it to crumble, then it, made, then it should crumble. Over the next few months, the EU is bracing itself for a battering. Big election gains are predicted for Eurosceptic anti-Islam Geert Wilders in the Netherlands. While in Italy, an early election could mean victory for anti-Euro Five Star. L'intelligenza non ci vuole capire, ha molti pregiudizi nei nostri confronti, per carità. Poi si, si sveglieranno un giorno con il Movimento 5 Stelle al governo e si domanderanno perché. We are going to lose one of the most magnificent constructions of peace that mankind has ever done. I don't care, I'm old, but I look at my children and I am really scared. In spring, France goes to the polls, with Marine Le Pen and her Front National standing strong. Elections follow in Germany. And all the while, a potentially messy divorce with Brexit Britain is being negotiated. It is no exaggeration to say that people in this town who believe passionately in what they have built over the last 60 years really do believe that the whole project is under threat now. We have something that the entire world looks as a miracle. They look at the European Union as a miracle of history and of political determination. We have an enormous strength and we spend our time talking about our own crisis. We should be proud of what we achieved, that uh, your country, uh, the United Kingdom, and my country, Germany, were enemies in that war and became friends. It was a 2,000 years history of war. And since uh, seven decades, we have no war. In my eyes, this is uh, a success story. C'est une Union européenne dans laquelle les capitales s'insultent ou se menacent, se font du chantage. On traite les Français de feignants, les Britanniques d'égoïstes, les Allemands de dictateurs, les Grecs de, de tricheurs. C'est ça l'Europe de la paix Non, ça c'est l'Europe de la guerre. Power brokers of Europe face an unprecedented challenge. For the EU, this is a battle to survive. Now, Brussels doesn't exactly have a reputation for moving fast, but something will have to give. It could be that our national debate in Britain about Brexit turns out to be an irrelevance. Sooner or later, the EU as we know it may no longer be there for us to leave.